My guest today is Graham Elwood. Uh, Graham is a comedian and a filmmaker from Chicago. Uh, Graham was behind the film Afghanistan, Comedy Downrange, which showed what it was like for a comedian in Afghanistan. And uh, Graham's new project is a documentary. It's called Bitcoin Saves El Salvador. Uh, of course, uh, following the people uh, and communities around El Salvador, following uh, the adoption of Bitcoin. Uh, really welcome to the show, Graham. Hey, Andy, thank you so much for having me, man. It is a pleasure. Let's do what we do at the beginning of the show, Graham. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Love to hear about your background as a comedian and, and filmmaker, and then we can talk about Bitcoin. But yeah, please tell us about your background. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I start. My name is uh, Graham Elwood, and I, I, you know, grew up in Chicago. I started doing stand up comedy when I was a freshman at the University of Arizona, and then when I graduated, moved back to Chicago, started doing stand up full time there. I moved to Los Angeles about twenty some years ago and started working in film and TV, hosted a bunch of TV show, game shows. Um, one was called Strip Poker, one was called Cram, and uh, and also was a film major. And, and, you know, my first documentary, as you said, was when I went in 2004 and 2006 to entertain the military in Afghanistan. And then I got into heavy into podcasting and I was one of the co-creators of the Los Angeles podcast festival and also uh, directed another documentary about podcasting called earbuds, the podcasting documentary, which is available on Amazon right now. And, you know, I've just been a, a touring stand-up comic and a filmmaker and a podcaster for a long time. And, you know, there's a series I directed that's also a stand-up comedy series um, that's also on Amazon prime called first nations comedy experience about it's a native American and indigenous people stand up comedy series. It's the first one ever of its kind. And so I'm just, I don't know. I've always been sort of drawn to sort of interesting, unique projects and, you know, I, I'm sure we'll get into it. I, I started getting into crypto about four years ago following Bitcoin. And so I paid attention to what was happening in El Salvador. And, you know, then I was like, I got to go down there. I got to see what's going to see what's going on, man. Like, this is like fascinating. And like a lot of us, like crypto and Bitcoin people, it's, it's seeing, you know, what, it, I don't know. I like, I, as a, as a filmmaker, especially, you know, it's about telling stories and documentary films to me are like going and investigating some subculture or or some section of the of, of of the the society that most people are not aware of you know that's that's what is unique that's what i that's what it interests me it's like i'd never been to a war zone i'm i was never in the military my family wasn't military people and so when a comedian asked me if i wanted to go perform in afghanistan i was like yeah i guess and my writing partner at the time tim bennett we were working on a screenplay and he goes dude bring a camera we got to make a documentary and i was like okay i wasn't i never like set out to be a documentary filmmaker i was doing scripted stuff um and so i just was like all right i'm going to document what being in a war zone is like through my eyes through the eyes of a comedian and you know, a lot of people, they're never going to go to Afghanistan. They're never going to see what a, what a forward operating base is or, or a small, you know, these small bases. They're never going to fly in a Black Hawk helicopter. And I got to take people along, you know, with my camera and show them what this is like. And so that's what sort of intrigues me about, you know, and then what, what podcasting really intrigues me because it's, a, it's again, I've, I've done over 300 episodes of TV. I've done stand up on late night TV, like the late, late show on, CBS and stuff. And those are great. But po the thing I was, when podcasting came along, you know, over 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, there's a, there's a stronger connection between the podcast host and the, and the listener, you know, when you, when you're on like a, a network TV show, there's this sort of, there's this buffer, there's this barrier. And so that's what we explored in earbuds, you know, and showed the connection between podcasters and fans and flew all over the world. You know, we went to Australia, we went to Japan and, and met people from all different walks of life and how podcasting connected them. And I think that's what, what's so intriguing to me about the Bitcoin space is specifically Bitcoiners are 
the most unique collection of people I've ever met in my life. I mean, you, I'm sure you know all different walks of life, all different political backgrounds, ideological, sociological backgrounds, but everybody kind of agrees Bitcoin is the future, man. Bitcoin and everyone, everyone, regardless of their background or their politics, agrees the central banking system isn't working and we need a new system and Bitcoin is it. So that's sort of, you know, what this documentary is going to focus on is this amazing, unique convergence and how El Salvador is this groundbreaking test case that yeah. is is insane. It's 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 like a, insane in a great way, in a in a fantastic way. So that's that's sort of a little bit about me and why I'm I'm on this journey. Yeah, interesting. And I was I was going to say, Graham, you know, do you describe yourself as you know, uh, I guess like crypto curious, a crypto person, or are you uh, a Bitcoiner kind of through and through? Because it's 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 a really interesting time for for Bitcoin and Bitcoiners. It's, it's always interesting, but man, it's it's interesting right now. And from you know one perspective, you could say that El Salvador were kind of early. They're 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 paving a, a path, if you like, for potentially uh, other small nation states to uh, potentially follow their lead. And of course, it's always going to be a struggle for for the first one. But um, yeah, well, let's let's talk about this a bit. So you've just been to El Salvador. You've spent some mm -hmm. time there, right? Yeah, I was just there a couple of weeks ago. I was there for about 10 days. And that was part of it. Like, I just want to see this for myself. I want to I want to see what this is about. And part of it is, too. I started about six years ago. I forgot to mention doing a like political YouTube show and podcast called Political Vigilante and where I really talk about how the two party system in America is very broken. Our, our system is completely broken and it's bought and paid for by billionaires and Wall Street and all that other stuff, which is how I got into learning about Bitcoin and crypto. And so... I interviewed two years ago, Max Kaiser yep. on my show because I was watching all these shows on RT. I was watching Chris Hedges show on RT. I was watching Boom Bust on RT. And as I started paying attention to crypto, um, to answer your, your first question, I started out as a crypto guy and now I'm becoming more and more of a Bitcoin maximalist, just seeing and learning. And it was Max Kaiser who really kind of taught me when he came on my show two years ago, him and his wife, Stacey Herbert, the difference between Bitcoin and crypto. And, and so I started following Max. I mean, I'd follow him online, but I st really started paying attention. And then when he moved, you know, then, then when Bukele announced in the summer of 2021, it became official September of 21. That was only a couple of months after I had had Max on my show. When he announced that Bitcoin was going to be legal tender in El Salvador. I was like, whoa. And I said on my on my show, on my podcast, I go, this is going to be the first domino. I said, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these Latin American countries, many of whom are being sanctioned by the United States empire, Venezuela, and you know, we're the United States empire has this, this long, rich history of intervening in all over the world, but specifically in Latin America. And I was like, oh, this is going to change things. And then Max and his wife moved down there and I started following them. And then when Bukele locked up in March, I think March of 2022, like 65,000 criminals, I was like, whoa. And at the beginning of this year, I started seeing Max and all these other people I started following on Twitter saying, El Salvador is now the safest country in Latin America. It used to be the murder capital. Like, yeah, we've gone whatever, 200 some days without a murder and all this stuff. I was like, whoa. So I met on Twitter, this woman, Sandy Waves, who that's her tour company. She's an El Salvadorian woman that gives tours. And she started advertising on Twitter. Like, I'll give you tours in my country. And she's a Bitcoiner. So it's really almost like she's like a Bitcoin tour guide in a sense. And I heard about Bitcoin Beach. And I was like, well, this is nuts, you know? And Bitcoin Beach, like some surfers, I'm a surfer, like started doing using Bitcoin. And from there, it's what got the president to adopt it. I'm sure it, it, I'm oversimplifying it, but I mean, that's basically the, the through line. I'm like, I got to go see this for myself. So I went down there, was going to be there for eight days. I stayed for 10. 
And I met all of these people in the Bitcoin community. And one of the, one of my things I was like, I was a little like, I'm a little skeptical. I'm a little bit of a cynic. And I was like, who's, is it just a bunch of rich people going, rich Bitcoiners going down there to buy up all the land and, you know, buy are they the, the people that are like buying Lamborghinis with, you know, and the Bitcoiners I met down there are there because sure, they see some financial investment opportunities, but they're really about giving back. They're really about helping the El Salvadorian people. So there's all these like NGOs springing up, like my premier Bitcoin and Hope House and, and, you know, Bitcoin Beach, where they're educating El Salvadorians about how to use Bitcoin in a circular economy. They're, they're, they're teaching them English. Um, in some instances, some people didn't have a formal education. They just sort, sort of streak, speak street Spanish and they're giving them a formal Spanish education. And it's, I was so impressed with that, on top of the fact that, hey, I rented a surfboard with Bitcoin. I bought food with Bitcoin. And, you know, that was cool stuff like that. Um, and the lack of crime. I've traveled throughout Latin America and I was prepared to like, you know, don't bring your wallet with you. Just keep a couple of bucks on you, you know, all that stuff. And they were like, don't worry about it. I'm like, really? They're like, yeah. You know, like. We were in downtown San Salvador at this cool monument. And, and I'm like, is it okay? And she's like, yeah, take photos. And I'm, and I'm literally, I've got my, you know, I've got my cell phone out and I'm taking photos and stuff to post on social media. And she goes, just so you know, about 18 months to two years ago, that would have been ripped out of your hand. And I'm seeing this like resurgence, this renaissance in El Salvador. And when I had dinner with Max Kaiser and Stacy. They were, they were like, you know, we lived in Berlin when the wall came down and it's sort of like that. There's this like Renaissance happening and, you know, look, it's a, it's a developing country. It's still, you know, you, you got to brush your teeth with bottled water and, you know, <laughs> and the infrastructure isn't like it is in the West, like in, in, in New Zealand or America or Western Europe, but you saw all this construction, you saw. And then there's all these things I've learned, and this is what I want to use with the documentary to inform the world is like the stuff you didn't realize, like El Salvadorians were paying $6 billion a year in extortion money to the gangs. Just about every El Salvadorian was affected by this. And it didn't care what business you ran, you were paying money. to. to so now there's $6 billion being put back into the economy that's not going in the pockets of gangsters. So I don't know, it was, it was just like in the last couple of years, you know, I'm a traveling comedian. I've been around a fair amount of the United States just in the last couple of years. I did a six country tour in Europe in October. And I can't tell you a place I've been to that had hope except El Salvador. The people there are like hopeful and there's a, there's like a bright future ahead and they can all see it. And so I was like, I got to make a documentary about this. Got it. Got it. I love it. So, uh, Graham, like, let's just uh, provide some context then. So I think it's, mm -hmm. I think when Bitcoin was made legal tender in El Salvador, uh, in my notes, I've got uh, September 7, 2021. So that's almost, almost two years ago. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of towards the end, I guess, of that um, 2021 uh, bull market and Bitcoin, uh, you know, things were a little bit more optimistic across the crypto markets. Uh, at that time. So, you know, you've been there, you've spent some time on the ground there, you've been talking to, uh, I'm sure, a multitude of Bitcoiners. Mm -hmm. it, it is a rite of passage at the moment, if you are a hardcore Bitcoiner, to go and spend some time in, in El Salvador and, yeah. you know, boots on the ground, help out on the ground, get the circular Bitcoin economy going. Of course, when El Salvador or, or uh, President Bekele did this, of course, from all the ratings agencies, you know, the usual crypto critics, of course, were very dismissive of this. And they said, look, this, this isn't going to work. It's going to be a disaster. Um, there's been pushback. I'm sure it's not a smooth ride. It's a, it's quite a transition uh, to, to make El Salvador the first country to even kind of attempt it. I'm sure, you know, if you talk to the normal, your average everyday people, there's a steep learning curve uh, to get involved uh, with Bitcoin. 
just give us your sense of of what it is like uh, on the ground, not just with with Bitcoiners, but maybe uh, yeah, the the kind of everyday people that are getting exposed to Bitcoin through this now. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, that's a great question, and that's I, I sort of had that similar question, and so with El, El Salvadorians, I mean, so you've got. It, it's sort of regional. I mean, like in El Tunco, which is which is where Bitcoin Beach is, you've probably got eighty percent adoption in those businesses in that town. Um, I'm oh, sorry, I'm sorry, El Zonte. El Zonte is Bitcoin Beach. My my correction. Uh, my El Zonte is Bitcoin Beach. So there's probably about 90 percent in the next beach town over, which is El Tunco, which is maybe twenty minutes away. It's 30, 40%. And they're just a little resistant for some reason. And then there's just certain places that are just kind of resistant. Um, and then there's people that really get it. And I think what happened, you know, in, in all fairness and full transparency, when last fall, Bitcoin had been legal tender in El Salvador for a little over a year. Um, so you went from September of 21 to November of 22 when the FTX scandal happened, which plummeted the Bitcoin price. So I think it was a new, so some of the, some of the locals were like, man, I had all this Bitcoin and now it it's, it went from, you know, 35 to 15 or whatever overnight. Ugh. and some people were like, I don't want to do this. But then in the last, you know, it took not even six months for Bitcoin to go from 15 back up to 30. So people, so I think, you know, that hurt, that kind of slowed down the learning curve a little bit. But I think one of the things that people like Sandy Waves, who is an Al Salvadorian, who lived there her whole life, she is really trying to advocate and she's trying to get store after store after store. And there's a lot of Al Salvadorians that are like, She's like, I'm working on that store. I'm working on that store. Like there's a surf shop. I was staying in El Tunco that I was renting a board and they didn't, they didn't accept Bitcoin, but I was like, she's like, I'm trying to convert them. So every time I'd go rent the board from them, I'd be like, I could pay you. They're like, no, not yet. I'm like, and so I think, I think it's going to, it will take some time for like to get the whole country to adopt it. But then if you look comparatively, Look, man, I live in Los Angeles. I can't, I, I don't know of any place that takes Bitcoin in America. I mean, I think I've seen one, one or two Bitcoin signs. Like there's one pawn shop, I think in Venice Beach or something that has a Bitcoin, accepts Bitcoin sign. I mean, I'm sure Auckland is, there's nowhere to, 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 to use Bitcoin. So, yeah, I, you know, when he implemented, when Bukele implemented that in September of 21, it wasn't like, oh, this will be overnight. And I think there's going to be a learning curve, but I think the learning curve will will pick up when we go back into another bull market, which we will. And you, you know, so so and and I think what part of the what I'm seeing from the Bitcoiners that are down there that are really trying to get the education is look, you've got to buy and sell Bitcoin to run your business, but you know, put a little bit aside, put whatever 10% aside and hodl it so that when it does jump up you know, you will profit from that because it will jump up in the long run. In the long run, it will go up. And that's like getting that point across, I think will be easier to do when we go on another bull run. But but I but I get it. Like you're running a business. It, it would be like, you know, if you as a New Zealander and the New Zealand dollar was doing well against the US dollar and then you're, on, you're, you're, you're in America for on a two month vacation in the middle of the trip, you know, the markets boom. And all of a sudden your New Zealand dollar isn't worth as much or something like that. Like I've traveled a fair amount when stuff like that happened. So that, that, that is a, that is an issue, but I think that issue is overcome for two reasons. One, like I was talking about the education of getting people to realize, hodl some of it, save some of it for the long haul. And then, you know, I mean, El Salvador is a surfing country. Ride those waves when they go up and down, and don't don't get too like tied into it emotionally. Um, and that's just part of it. And know that the more you save for the long run, the more you will bring in full profit. So it was the Bitcoin adoption varies from town to town and region to region. But the one thing that is consistent, everyone I talked to liked Bukele because he locked up the criminals. And they're not being terrorized and they're not being extorted on a daily basis. I mean, what those gangs did was horrific. 
So the fact that he's done that, the fact that also previous political, you know, presidents and political parties, he he started a third, he's part of like a third party. They had two, like a typical conservative and, and liberal party that were very corrupt. He's now not stealing money like his predecessors. So even that money's going back into infrastructure and that money's going back into the system. So I think I think it's going to be exponential growth as more companies he's 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 offering great tax incentives if you bring your business in there and use bitcoin and as the adoption happens one thing that's like Sandy Waves told me she she always and she she taught me this on day 1 she goes always ask accept our bitcoin anywhere we go even if you know they don't just to get them to go oh I should start accepting this and she goes, she started noticing in the last couple months, people went from saying no to not yet. So is there, so like, yeah, she goes, it's coming. It, absolutely. And it's, you know, all, all crypto people, all Bitcoiners know it's just, you know, the, the bear bull market cycles that you go through. Uh -huh. This is traditionally how new people come into Bitcoin. They come in uh, during the bull market. They get really excited. They buy some Bitcoin. They think it's going, you know, to the moon, as people say. And then, of course, the bear market hits and it's it's easy to uh, lose hope, get really depressed because, you know, the, the volatility on the up is incredibly exciting. The volatility on the down is incredibly depressing. That's just how the cycle works. But if you can hold through that, be a cycle, uh, then the sun comes out again and a whole new wave comes in. And I'm sure we'll see that uh, process uh, continue to repeat. Of course, we're seeing other factors like, you know, the potential BlackRock spot Bitcoin ETF, uh, those kind of signals from, you know, the I guess the mainstream legacy traditional finance world, that'll change things as well. And, and I think just the idea that things can change really quickly if, if other small countries, nation states, the likes of Venezuela and so on, uh, other parts of Latin America decide to follow El Salvador's lead, uh, that'll be incredible. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, Graham, that, yeah, the uh, Bukele has created, you know, tax incentives, things like that to attract uh, Bitcoiners or Westerners who have uh, some some financial resources, some crypto resources into the country to uh, start up businesses. So, yeah, what do you see? What what do those, what kinds of businesses, uh, what kind of characters are, uh, are coming into El Salvador? I know the uh, Brave New Coin founder, Franz Strainer, he's in El Salvador at the moment, um, having a look around. I think you've met him as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, what, what, what's happening? You know, yeah, I, I met Fran who who introduced us and, you know, he had like a little dinner party with all these different Bitcoiners who were kind of from all different walks of life, some El Salvadorian, some like uh, an Aussie that's doing a, a beef business down there because he can grow and, you know, raise better cattle for beef. I don't really know that industry than he could with the restrictions of, of Australia. So there's that, there's, and, you know, it's, and, and part of what this documentary is going to cover, as you talked about, is it's not just El Salvador, but all the Bitcoin bubbles that are popping up, like in Costa Rica, in Guatemala, there's Bitcoin Lake, um, you know, Nicaragua and Uruguay. I think some of they're doing they're doing some some green energy mining. There's a big mining project that Max Kaiser is a part of in El Salvador. So there's that there's there's and the mining is is being done by wind and solar, which totally debunks the whole Bitcoin's bad for the environment, you know, uh, trope that we hear. So the people that I'm seeing down there, you know, they see investment opportunity, but they, they're not just like looking to just come in and fleece the country. They're really about giving back. They're all like Bitcoin maximalists, many of whom were similar to myself. They came in, they bought some Bitcoin initially, bought some crypto, were hoping to buy some, you know, buy something at five cents and it was going to go to a thousand and everyone was going to be able to retire or whatever. And sort of saw some of the, there's some good crypto crypto projects, but, but, you know, realizing that those are more like securities and Bitcoin is, is obviously digital gold. So that's, and when I asked, I had dinner with Max Kaiser and I said, so what does this country need? And he goes, well, Graham, for, for the last four decades, it's had either gang violence um, or the civil war from 1980 to 1992 and absolute 
political corruption. So it could use anything. It it it. So there's all this. Think of you know this cool stuff down there that that. So there's people coming in, you know, developers, you know, software developers, and they're training young El Salvadorian kids to do software development. There's there's, I mean yoga studios and and a lot of El Salvadorians that fled the country in the 80s during the civil war are moving back you know because it's safe now um i met a woman that's a yoga teacher and she you know her parents fled when she was a child in the 80s and now she's she's an adult and she's like i want to come back and you know spread yoga around this country because no one was doing <laughs> yoga when you were running from the gangs and stuff like that so it's really you know, it's everything is coming down there and it's all, it all seems very positive. And the tax breaks are like, you know, and you have to hire like around 85% El Salvadorians, which that's cool. That's very reasonable. And, you know, there's, there's your business doesn't have to pay taxes for, I think up to 10 years. It doesn't have to pay income tax, um, which is a huge incentive. Also, you can bring, um, you know, any sort of equipment into the country and not have to pay a tariff when you get through customs that they used to have a 50% tariff. So if you brought in a thousand dollar piece of a machinery, you, it, you had to pay $500. So, it was, you know, I mean, it just was cost prohibitive. Now they're encouraging people to come down here and, you know, they're, they're building two new hospitals. Um, there's a new library going up in downtown San Salvador that is being, that's a joint joint funding from the El Salvadorian government and the Chinese government. Um, I think it's going to be, I think that country is going to be in, in the next five to 10 years is going to be a tech hub, you know, and right now they, they get a lot of tourism. It's a beautiful country. You know, there's great surfing, there's hiking, there's, you know, um, and, and the people are really friendly. And uh, I think there's going to be an agricultural boom. I think there's going to be, I mean, you name it, there's a bunch of cool things that can be happening there. Um, green energy, uh, yeah. that's a big, they're offering tax breaks for green energy. They're offering tax breaks for technology. Um, so I, I think it's, I think it's really going to be an exciting place, you know, and I want to, I want to capture this on film for the, for what it's like in the early days. So how does that work then, Graham? Um, like, have you started filming? Uh, what does that filming process look like? Uh, are you quite like uh, nimble? Do you have a big crew, or is it just you and a and a camera guy, like kind of uh, you know fast and furious, or you know, uh, what, what's going on? So the, when I was just down there, it was just me shooting stuff mainly for my YouTube channel and also to put together like a little promotional reel to kind of get a taste of what it is. I'm currently in the process of raising money to do a, a feature length documentary where I would have a crew of about five, six people um, and travel throughout Central America for probably a little over a month in October and and finishing up. Um, they're having a Bitcoin conference in El Salvador, November, I think, uh, six, seven, and eight, I believe is the dates. So that's the process. And then I want to interview, you know, locals, politicians. I want to really show people how dangerous it was before and how, you know, and then also show other countries that could benefit from this, you know, um, so right now we're in the fundraising stage and, you know, we've got, uh, we've got some investors interested, but we're looking for more. So if there's anybody, any like Bitcoin investors out there that are looking to fund this project, please hit me up directly. Cause I can send you over, uh, you know, a, a pitch deck and a budget and, and it's a really exciting project and all the people like Fran that I met down there, um, uh, Francesco Barbati, other people that I met down there, the conversation I had with Max and Stacy, they were very like, oh, this is a cool this is a cool project because I want this movie. I, I, I'm not going to make this movie for people in the Bitcoin space because we're all advocates for it. But I want to show people that like don't understand Bitcoin or oh, I've heard of this show. No, this is how it's actually being used. This is how it's pulling people out of poverty in El Salvador. And this is how like a real government, a, a like once in a 500 year type leader that Bukele is, you know, and how he's doing things that politicians have, have couldn't do because they were just too corrupt or whatever. So 
th that's where we're at with the project. We're trying to raise money for it. So if anybody in your audience is interested, please hit me up. Um, we've already got some other interest and, and we're looking to close funding pretty soon and, and be down there shooting because I, my goal is to get this movie shot in October, November, edit it and have it done by March. So it's ready to come out when the having starts. Cause when the having happens in April of next year, that's when we're going to go into another bull run. And that's when everyone's going to go, wait a minute, what's this Bitcoin thing? It went from 30 to 45 in a day. Like what, how, how do I get involved or whatever? So that's yes. the goal. Yes, indeed. And look, you're exactly right, Graham. I think, you know, that's uh, one of the things I guess I was hinting at at the beginning of the show when I said it's an interesting time uh, for Bitcoin and, and Bitcoin is simply because, yeah, we're now, I don't know what it is, but yeah, uh, eight months away or whatever from, from the next Bitcoin halving, uh, which will just bring, uh, if nothing else, a lot of uh, media attention back to Bitcoin it does tend to traditionally signal the beginning, perhaps, of the next Bitcoin uh, bull market. And of course, that that uh, BlackRock ETF as well. So yeah, there's a lot of um, potentially big signals that will bring the spotlight uh, back to Bitcoin. Let's finish off this part of the podcast then, Graham. Um, you said, yeah, you're looking for people uh, that maybe want to get involved, help out, help fund the documentary, the film. Uh, just just tell people where they can go if they if they want to reach out and, and chat to you. I think probably the best place is Twitter. Twitter seems to be really where the Bitcoin community is, is, is talking. So my Twitter handle is at Graham Elwood, G-R-A-H-A-M-E-L-W-O-O-D reach out to me on Twitter uh, and let's talk from there. Because one of the things too, I kind of, you know, look, if, if someone isn't a Bitcoiner and they want to invest in this, that that's great. But I, I really feel like the Bitcoin community should fund this. I want this to be like a, one of the first Bitcoin funded movies. Um, Cause I think that's also kind of my, my longer vision is more cause I've worked in the entertainment industry for, for 25 years of, of more, projects that like are, are like I see like Bitcoin and film and video production is this perfect merger because it's it's right now my my union sag after and the Writers Guild we're on strike in America because these big streaming services like Netflix and Amazon they're making all this money billions of dollars their executives are making are paid tens of millions of dollars a year and us performers and writers aren't getting any money. And it's like, that's why I love, I love crypto and Bitcoin specifically is it's, it, you can't hide the money, man. Like I, I have a TV show that I did, cram, uh, it, it's a game show. It's on the game show network, which is owned by Sony. They've been rerunning the show for the last two seasons and I've gotten $0, Andy. I'm the host of the show. I'm in 90% of the shots. I'm getting zero money. So part of why I want to do this documentary and also I really want to get more involved. I, you know, with the Bitcoin community, I appreciate Fran putting us in touch and you having me on your show because I know I have a, a an area of expertise and experience that a lot of people in the Bitcoin community don't have, you know? And so I, I want to bring this because I think like Bitcoin content creation, Bitcoin TV and film production is going to be the future because again, we can put the whole, all the contract, we can put all of it on the blockchain. So, you know, these big media, part of the, part of the strike is we want these companies like Netflix to release their financials. They won't tell us what's being made, what happened. I mean, in the old days, a movie was box office and we knew how many tickets were sold and, but now they're hiding it. We don't know. And that's the thing I love about blockchain and Bitcoin is we would all know I would make a movie Everybody would get paid. The whole movie would be paid and funded in Bitcoin. So every time we receive profits in Bitcoin, it would automatically get dispersed to everybody's worked on it. So you just wake up and look at your wallet and go, oh, I got my residual Bitcoin today. You know, rather than I just literally last week, I got a, a TV show I did on Comedy Central. I got a five cent residual check. Five cents, which was kind of sweet, man, because I just went out and bought a yacht for three cents and then a, a private jet for one penny and then another penny. I just, you know, I just took to Vegas. So I've been living that baller life with those five pennies, man. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's how people can help us out, man, is, is fund this project. And I want to, and I want to develop long-term relationships 
with people in the Bitcoin space that want to invest in cool projects that, hey, that'll make us money, but will also change the industry. I want to change show business to get it out of the hands. And the same way we want to get the money out of the hands of the central bankers, I want to get I want to get show business out of the hands of these billionaire tech companies that don't want to pay people for their labor. So I, I'm I'm excited at like the possibility of new partnerships with people in the Bitcoin space and creating a whole new world where everybody benefits. Just like everyone can be their own bank with Bitcoin. You know, and as Bitcoin, we know in the next 10, 20 years, if you own one Bitcoin, you're going to be set, <laughs> you know, and uh, so that's, that's what I'm doing. And that's how, so, so please reach out to me uh, on social media at Graham Elwood, all my, or GrahamElwood.com is my website, but all my social media handles are at Graham Elwood, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, but Twitter's probably the best place because that's where all the Bitcoiners are and direct message me, hit me up. And then let's, let's set up a call and talk and let's make this happen, man. And, and let's, let's change the world. We'll get a lot of press off of this too. I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Graham. Uh, we'll put links uh, in the show notes to your website uh, and your Twitter. Uh, nothing else to say really, except yeah, wish you the absolute best uh, with uh, the film, with the project. I hope you can, um, yeah, get it. Uh, filmed, produced, edited, and out in time for the next uh, Bitcoin halving early next year. Um, but yeah, all the best and bye for now. Thanks, Andy. Thank and thank you to your audience. Well, there you go. That was uh, Graham Elwood, comedian, documentary filmmaker, uh, making uh, a film called Bitcoin Saves El Salvador. Yeah, it's good to get a little bit of insight into what is happening on the ground in El Salvador must have Fran on the show uh, to talk about this soon as well um, but yeah fascinating experiment great to see uh, President Bukele really you know take the plunge and uh, lead the world and being the first nation state to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender so can't do anything uh, but give him his kudos for doing that uh, thank you for listening team don't forget to subscribe to the crypto conversation and whatever podcast app you are using but that is today's show thank you this was the crypto conversation for brave new coin <laughs>